stimulating interaction with members of the RCC since my arrival in Munich. Uh, I hope this presentation can be the occasion for further interesting ex exchanges and debates. So, let's start with this famous uh, statement of Richard Carson myself. Man is part of nature, and his war against nature is inevitably a war against himself. With this presentation, I argue that this very rhetorical statement carries a deeper truth in what could be called an East Side story or prehistory of Silent Spring. This project is part of the emerging but already prolific field of war in the environment, made prominent by engineering scholars such as Edmund Russell and John McNeil, but one might might also go back to the pioneering works of the ecofeminist scholar uh, uh, Calvin Marchant. My contribution to this field falls into Russian and Soviet studies. In this talk, I will try to show that the, the prolonged predominance of the agricultural economy and the intimate relationship uh, between war and the Soviet system make the heuristic of these entangled histories of war and nature particularly rewarding for this area in period. First, let's recall that the Bolsheviks seized power during the Great War and built the, their dictatorships through a continuum of crisis, ending with the Civil War, thereby channeling the violence of total war inward. The forced collectivization of agriculture launched in the late 1920s by Stalin was an unprecedented and cataclysmic experiment attempting to modernize the countryside in the context of a looming inevitable war. The collectivization triggered another wave of ruthless state violence against the peasantry. This was a time when cataclysmic social conflicts and man-made natural disasters telescoped with great intensity. My research thus analyzes pest control policies and practices in late imperial and early Soviet Russia as strongly interconnected with war, forced labor, and mass repression. I draw on several works at the crossroads of environmental history and science studies, both fields uh, developing a new interest for the material world. This multiple approach covers several areas of inquiry, the interrelations between nature and imperialism, the issue of natural disasters and, the social and, political, and their social and political mediations, the circulations and transnational entanglements across the communist capitalist divide, as well as the complex assemblages of humans and environments. This talk is divided in four parts, in which I will try to combine chronological and thematic aspects. First, I will address the conditions for the rise of modern pest control in late imperial Russia. So in order to fully understand the impact of the continuum of crisis unfolded by World War I in the second part. Then I will turn to the organic ties between the military, science, and agriculture emerging from total war, looking especially to the deep connections between pest control and the military industrial complex. I will end with the forced collectivization as an intertwined war against the peasantry and nature. The rise of modern pest control in late imperial Russia. During the accelerating agricultural collectivization of the peripheries of the Russian Empire in the 19th century, several regions experienced important environmental changes. For one, peasant settlers and farming gradually replaced the nomadic economy in the steppes. The growing intensification of agriculture transformed the ecologies of the southern fertile regions in Novorossiya, or New Russia. It triggered more severe and frequent pest outbreaks. And lastly, areas which had traditionally been considered as hostile for farming in the Caucasus and Central Asia were more intensely colonized and reclaimed for agriculture. In correlation with these environmental changes during the last decades of the 19th century, a new generation of pest specialists emerged in Russia in emulation with their American colleagues. Travels and exchanges of scientific literature connected the zoology, entomology, and phytopathology <coughs> uh, communities of Russia and North America at the turn of the century. A significant connection was made, for example, in 1907, when the director of 
Federal Bureau of Entomology in Washington took a trip to Europe. His visit to his colleagues in southern Ukraine aimed at finding an exotic predator able to counterbalance the invasion of the gypsy moss in New England. As you can see on this map, he failed. <laughs> Similarly to the American case, a series of natural disasters have kick-starting the, the institutionalization of pest control in Russia. For example, as Marina Voskutova and Anastasia Fedotova have shown, in the 1870s and 80s, major rain beetle proliferations in the southern regions brought the pest issue into focus for the authorities. The growth of pest control, however, remained as slow as, slow as the changes of the autocracy until very lately. The Stolypin reforms, aiming at, modernized, at modernization, gave a new impetus for the growth of agricultural sciences. A generation of pest control specialists from the Educated Society of Russia was striving to bring both science and progress to agriculture and enlightenment to what they considered to be the dark masses of the peasantry. As Deborah Fitzgerald has shown, economists gained great influence in agriculture during the first decades of the 20th century. Correlated to this movement was a key strategy of the economic entomologist, collecting data and translating the damages caused by insects into profit loss for the nation. In Russia, entomologists emulated these professional strategies. In the final years of the Tsarist regime, and again the, the Soviet ages, they repeatedly stated that the various insects in the empire were causing the astronomical damages of two and a half billion rubles every year. So the Russian and Soviet, uh, the Russian and Soviet political elite and professionals were particularly inspired by William Howard's 1906 book, The New Earth, uh, a recital for the triumphs of modern agriculture in America. One week, one week was used repeatedly by professionals to promote the increase of pest control measures to their Bolshevik patrons. If the nation, if the nation, I think the battery is down, if the nation were compared to pay out, say, as a war indemnity or for some loan incurred through national extravagance or thrift, a sum equal to the loss now sustained by insect pests, it would arouse universal revolt. The second decisive tool for the rise of pest control was, of, of course, the emergence of chemical pesticides. The first heavy metal pesticides, like paracetamol and lead arsenates, appeared at the end of the 19th century. Pesticides and sprays started to be imported on a large scale in the Russian Empire during the last decade before the Great War. They were increasingly used in the rich orchards, vineyards, and monocultures of New Russia but they also began to be crucial, crucial new tools for colonial authorities in the struggle against locust invasions, especially to protect, to protect the growing cotton fields in Central Asia and the Caucasus. War, revolution, and natural disasters. World War I had paradoxical effects on the emergence of pest control in Russia. The scarce and still emerging network of research and control stations first collapsed and only began recovering, recovering in 1918 under the aegis of the Bolshevik regime. Simultaneously, though, the huge agricultural abandonments due to the mass mobilization from the front with the destruction brought by the armies roaming the countryside, it created tremendous ecological disruptions, especially in the fertile south where the battles of the civil war took place. The social and environmental context set the path for the proliferation of rodents, weeds, insects, and parasites. The, the, situation, the situation was particularly bad in the fried vineyards and orchards in the southwest. In 1920-21, at the end of the Civil War, the end of the Civil War was blurred by multiple peasant insurrections creating green armies and rural banditry. During these chaotic times, Rebels, pests, and predators of all kinds were all menacing crops, livestock, and social order in the countryside. Thus, the reinstatement of the authority of the state by the Bolsheviks at the end of the Civil War was a more than human endeavor. 
For the government, the social and environmental dangers collided with new intensity during the spring of 1921, when a huge drought creating a terrible famine in the Volga region was followed by extraordinary locust proliferation in the south. In a difficult political context, alarming messages from the political police about locust attacks and possible social unrest in the countryside were channeled to Lenin himself. The chief of the Soviet government immediately signed a warlike operational order to enroll military specialists and mobilize peasants <coughs> and soldiers. This warlike emergency regime of mobilization was sustained for three years. In many areas during the 1920s, intense struggles against banditry overlapped with massive locust proliferation. The authorities often feared that the crop destructions would feed peasant rebellions. And the other way around, several territories occupied by bandits prevented the best specialists to map the locust infestation, thus increasing the risks of unanticipated, unanticipated natural disasters. This nexus of crisis worked as an incubator for pest control in the Soviet Union. In 1923, 40 stations had mushroomed in the inf infested region thanks to the flow of money secured by the specialists from the party state, notwithstanding the Great Famine. In order to create a permanent pest control apparatus, entomologists, zoologists and their allies capitalized on the so-called mass pests to advertise an increasing number of pests. As one of them proclaimed, we have to show to each landowner the enemies he is living with and show him to which terrible danger he remains in contact every day, every hour, every minute. The new tools of statistics gradually helped this endeavor. There was a renewed period of statistical empirism <coughs> under the Soviet regime. Following this trend, one young specialist promoted the so-called mass statistical method. This method was advertised as an asset when one was aiming at demonstrating the harmfulness of a specific insect. The aim was to develop, was to drop samples for large-scale surveys in order to produce what Jan Akin called avalanches of numbers. Indeed, during this time of social and environmental crisis, the statistical translation fully played out. Due to this instrumental usage of statistics, the, of the official numbers of the main pests in the Soviet Union skyrocketed. During this, period of crisis, uh, during this period of crisis, a shift in the depiction of the most important pests occurred. They were now portrayed as massive per se and called mass pests, Masori of Redditi. As Sarah Jensen has shown in the German case, this new vision was interrelated to evolving, evolving perceptions of the population, increasingly viewed as a social mass in an age of total war and mass politics. Eventually, this picture of mass pests implied the requirement of more radical methods for complete eradication to stop this seemingly spontaneous proliferation. While science and agriculture the unprecedented mobilization of scientists for total war crystallized in multiple interprofessional collaboration and in emulation with similar institutions of major capitalist countries, especially in the United States and Germany. After the war, entomologists, chemists, and engineers continued their collaborations across the military and civil spheres through various scientific networks and social paramilitary organizations. This would, of course, deeply impact pest control in the Soviet Union. Two new weapons of total war linked together an array of professional communities across the military and civil spheres. The first we weapon transferred to agriculture was the gas cylinder. The Imperial Army started to produce gas cylinders after the first chemical attack of the German Army in May 1915 in Bolumov. However, most of these gas cylinders couldn't be routed to the front lines before the war ended. As the imports of pesticides was interrupted during the years of blockade between 1918 and 1922, a pest specialist and a military chemist teamed up to experiment using leftover gas cylinders from the army for the <coughs> extermination of ground squirrels. The 
first civil military collaboration paved the way for many joint researches of war chemicals in the military laboratories and experimental fields. <coughs> the second weapon transferred to agriculture was the plane. 200,000 planes were produced during the Great War and many were redirected for civil purposes. In 1921, plane dusters were experimented in Hawaii by federal entomologists in collaboration with the U.S. Army. The next year, the experiment was reproduced in the Soviet Union with similar civil military collaborations. Contrary to the, success, to the successful American endeavor, though, and because of the lack of resources, the Soviet experiments proved to be blatant failures. However, the growing interest of the Red Army for developing an aerochemical weapon, a transnational popular myth and military fad in the 1920s, eventually helped the pest specialists to force the, the introduction of the aerial dusting of pesticide as a main technology for modernizing Soviet agriculture. The model of the German war economy of Kriegswirtschaft was fully adopted by the Bolshevik regime emerging from total war. Already in 1923, the elite of the Red Army called for the chemicalization of the economy and agriculture. This was supposed to provide the impetus for a massive chemical consumption and the creation of insecticides and fertilizers, factories, which could be turned into military plants for war. Consequently, during the 1920s, space control became deeply harnessed to an emerging military industrial complex through a policy of dual purpose. This policy aimed at developing overlapping scientific and engineering research of chemicals and sprayers, industrial productions, and even training of peasant soldiers for both pest control and the imagined inevitable air and chemical war of extermination. The first five year plan established in 1928 by the regime was targeting a rise in the use of 30%. At that time, pest control became an important lever of for yield increase. Stalin's 1929 forced collectivization of the peasantry took place in the context of rising international tensions and a grain collection crisis in the countryside. The collectivization consequently replayed the telescoping of natural disasters and civil war struggles of the early Soviet period. Indeed, during this great break, two massive pest proliferations overlapped with the renewed peasant rebellions. While it, did not, while it did not have a decisive effect on Soviet agriculture, it gave a new impulse for the creation of a wider pest control system backed financially and ideologically by the Red Army and the chemical sector. A new Soviet system of pest control was implemented during the early 1930s, where plain dusting was, su was supposed to be the leading mass machine. The Soviet uh, the Soviets were mainly trying to emulate the American industrialized agriculture that it intended to catch up and overtake, according to Stalin's famous statement. Contrary to the American reference, though, the Soviet system of pest control remained highly and systematically dysfunctional and in a constant state of crisis during the 1930s. At the beginning of the 1930s, more than 400 warehouses of, with chemicals and sprayers were scattered across the countryside during the collectivization campaigns. This network of so-called stations of machines of destruction was in, initially set up for both, both for the procurement of the collective and state farms across, across the countryside and for the military units in case of war. These institutions were also very much political basis of the party state in an increasingly hostile countryside. Furthermore, the production of statistics of pest distributions across Soviet, the Soviet Union was now centralized in Leningrad and Moscow. The knowledge and surveillance about the pests and their dynamics of proliferations was increased, increasingly politicized and generally correlated to the impulses of the forced grain collection campaigns made by the state in the countryside. The wholesale collectivization of agriculture entered a new period of crisis in 1931. It culminated in the terrible famine of 1932-33, which had denied 
which was denied, aggravated, and used by the Stalinists to eliminate the reluctant peasants. The cataclysmic disruptions of the rural economy, the bad weather conditions in 1931 and 32, and the deep structural resistance of the peasantry in the collective farms made for a complex environmental and social crisis in many regions of the region. The new system of pest control reached its institutional and operational apex during the, the final years. It was transformed into a, fight, a fighting organization of the party state aiming at increasing the yields mechanically by increasing best extermination operations. The Stalinists linked together the human and non-human enemies of Soviet agriculture. Targeted enemies were dehumanized as social pests, such bred elements. There was, of course, a deep relation between the peasants and their natural environment, and it had political implications to understanding. For example, the proliferations of weeds or rodents in the fields were considered by the authorities as a proof for the unwillingness of the collectivized peasant to work conscientiously. And the mass, the mass deportations of enemy peasants led to proliferations of weeds and pests in the abandoned fields. The forced collectivization was an inextricable human and environmental disaster, but the Stalinists claimed their victory over the countryside in early 1934. This apex of crisis would also be one key, ma key matrix moment for defining the relation of the regime to its environment and society. This early history of warfare and pest control is still very much with us. <coughs> At this point, I have tried to give you a, a bird eye view of this research, of this research based on my, on my dissertation. Of course, many other angles are involved in these very rich and complex topics such as scientific controversies, transnational scientific collaborations, the medical expertise, and many other issue, issues for which I am now furthering this research at the RCC. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>